It's been a great day so far. We've got a whole bunch of great speakers coming. Our next speaker is one of the most outspoken critics of big government, helping to provide inspiration for the Tea Party movements helping that is currently sweeping Louisiana and the nation. He enjoys a national reputation for being the premier advocate for liberty in America and promoting limited constitutional government, promoting low taxes, free markets, and a return to the sound monetary policy. He's known for his consistent voting record in the House of Representatives. Dr. Paul never votes for legislation. He never votes for legislation unless the proposed measure is expressly authorized by the Constitution. <laughs> Novel idea. Ladies and gentlemen, our Constitution is worth defending, and Dr. Paul wants us to defend it. So please join me in welcoming a true champion for limited government, Dr. Ron Paul. Sounds like a freedom rally. Thank you very much. Well, it's, it's great to see so much enthusiasm for the freedom movement and limited government. I want to thank the host of this uh, convention for inviting me. So I'm delighted to be here, and I'm delighted to be among friends. My wife is here with me today, and I am pleased very much with that, too. You know, this... Uh, this last week, there was a report that came out on Friday, just, uh, just yesterday. It came from the Treasury. And it, was, uh, it even shocked me, even having been concerned about deficits, you know, like about 35 years ago. <laughs> but yesterday it was reported by the Treasury that this past week, our national debt went up $106 billion in one day. And I would say... It's time to end that kind of spending and get rid of the deficits. <laughs> Getting rid of the deficits is easily said. I guess everybody wants to get rid of the deficits. And, you know, there is an effort in Washington today on our side of the aisle, which is well-intended, might do some good, but I think it comes up way too short. And that is the dwelling on earmarks. Now let me tell you about earmarks. Earmarks, if you vote against an earmark, you don't save a penny. What you do is you take the responsibility away from the Congress and you give the money to the executive branch and believe me, they'll waste it even more than the Congress will waste it. But my argument is that earmarks, that is the responsibility of the Congress. We're supposed to designate every single penny that we spend. We're not supposed to let the president do this. I don't like a strong executive branch. I want a strong Congress that exerts its prerogatives. What we, not, what we need is not to tinker with earmarks, but to vote against the entire package, vote against the appropriation bills until we get this budget under control. Also, also the definition of an earmark is very important. They claim that an earmark is when uh, the government takes your highway funds, send it to Washington, and your congressman says, well, why don't we get some of our highway funds back and spend it in our district? That's what they want to stop. But when it comes to an earmark for building a embassy, which we are now doing in London, which is a fortress, it's going to cost us a billion dollars. 
Why are we doing that? It makes no sense whatsoever. At the same time, we're tinkering around with some, some, some spending bills here and trying to build a highway. We have spent a billion dollars on an embassy in Baghdad. We're spending another billion dollars on an embassy in, in, uh, in Kabul. That doesn't make any sense unless you think we have unlimited funds, and we don't. This is the message that is coming today. The reason why the American people have awoken and they are so upset and annoyed and they're acting outside the party system is because the country is broke and the people in Washington won't admit it. We need to admit it. Which means you have two choices if you think we should have a balanced budget. One, you raise taxes. I haven't met a Republican in a long time that wants to raise taxes, thank goodness. But, the other side of the coin is you cut spending. Now, if we were so good at cutting spending, where were we when we had the chance? Well, we have created... Well, we have, as Republicans over the last several decades have created is a credibility gap. We talk a good game, but when we get the chance to do something, we haven't done the job that we should have. I'll tell you what, though. We're doing, we're doing a better job now in opposition. The credibility is, is when we get the chance again, which I believe we will, how credible are we going to be? How well are we going to stick to our guns? How significant are we going to be when we take seriously our oath of office? Just think. If we, we didn't do anything else than elect individuals who you could trust that would always obey the Constitution, we'd get out of this mess in no time. You know, the, the question has been raised is whether or not our president is a socialist. And I, I am sure there's some people here that believe it, and I know uh, this conference has talked about that already, and I think it's very important, and he deserves a lot of criticism. But, you know, in, a, in, a, in the technical sense, in the economic definition of what a socialist, no, he's not a socialist. What he is, what he is, is a corporatist. And unfortunately, we have corporatists in the Republican Party, and that means you take care of corporations, and corporations take over and run the country. We see that in the financial institution. We see it in the military-industrial complex. And now, and now we see it in the medical-industrial complex, who runs medicine. Just think of how the corporations got between the doctor and the patient. And believe me, I went through the experience of enter entering medicine when there were no Medicare and no, no medicine, Medicare or Medicaid, and the doctor and the patient made the decisions. Today, it's the drug companies, it's the insurance companies, it's the HMO, and now with this passage of bill, if we don't eradicate it and get rid of it, now we're going to have thousands of government bureaucrats between the doctor and patient. We need to change. We have an obligation to do some changing here, and hopefully after November we will. But I, um, I have a piece of legislation I'll be introducing next week. 2,000 pages. Of course, the simple answer was would have been to reject it, and the next thing is throw it all out. That's not going to happen. But there's going to be one piece of legislation I'm going to introduce. It'll probably be only one page long. And it will be to remove the mandate that you have to participate if you don't want to.
I have a belief that if we always retain the option to get out, no matter how bad the government bears down on us, we can survive. For instance, education, have you noticed it's a mess ever since the federal government got involved in it? Do you remember the old days of the Republican Party when our, when our platform says, get rid of the Department of Education? But fortunately, we have had the private option protected. And that is, you still have the right, and many of you, I'll bet, are exerting that right. You have the right to opt out, educate your own kids, or send them to private school.